All right, good morning, Eastern Heights. We're so glad you're here to worship with us today. Would you please stand as we begin our service with a call to worship, a passage of Scripture to set our minds on God's Word that He is truly calling us together this morning. From Psalm chapter 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Put your hands together and sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe first display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art how great thou art when i think and when i think that god is son not sparing send him to die i scarce can take it on the cross and on the cross my burden gladly wearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to me how great thou art how great My soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Christ shall come, when Christ shall come. Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? I shall bow, then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! Then sings my soul. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. You may be 
be seated. It's good to see you this morning as we come together. Hard to, hard to realize that a year ago, right in this building was a bunch of tables set up when we were doing the Women's Evangelism Conference. Uh, word was kind of spreading around that there was this disease that was out there, that people were getting sick. We were doing a whole lot of cleaning of the building, but nobody really knew what all that meant and what was going to happen, and it ended up being the only women's evangelism uh, conference that they were able to do that year, and within a few months, we were having to shut down, and I remember a lot of pastors are talking, they're going, what are we going to do, what are we going to do, what are we going to do, and then finally we started asking instead, what is God doing, what is God doing, what is God doing? And over the past year, we've seen a lot of what God is doing. And every Sunday, as we come in here, as we gather together to worship together uh, physically here or whether we're doing it online, the question we should be asking ourselves is, what is God doing? And what is God wanting to do in my life? So would you guys just join me in a word of prayer? Let's just start that off this morning. Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning in this place, as we come in here with our different trials and our different successes, as we, we come in this place with a, some a good week and for some a frustrating week, Lord, we, we don't want to come in here and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? But we want to come in here and say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And how can I get involved? So, Lord, as we go in this time of worshiping you in music, as we look at your word, let us continuously ask ourselves that question. God, what is it that you're wanting to do? And how can I be involved? In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship God in music. Amen. Would you please stand as we continue together? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet, oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. to trust him more so glad Jesus, 
how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. continue to sing together in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was made here in the death of christ i live ground there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no guilt in life no fear in death the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand till he returns or calls me here in the power of Christ I'll stand No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed is your name. 
Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us all of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from every evil. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever. And God, as we turn to your word, help us now to receive what you are speaking to us today so that we can be transformed and glorify you and you alone. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, praise team. Well, we have been moving through the book of James. Hard to believe we started in October, starting to look at this book and move through it. And uh, we have seen some amazing things as we've gone through it. I think what's been the really neat to me is to have people come up and say, man, that passage really just spoke to me today. That really was relevant. That really applies to my life. And I realize here this book written 2,000 years ago, and yet it is incredibly applicable today, reminds us of the power of the scriptures. That they, they are, the, the time that goes on with them doesn't take away from the power that's in them, that being the very word of God and the application that they give to our lives should encourage us to want to study the scriptures even more. So before we finish off our study of James, I wanted to go back and look at two verses that we looked at early on just to remind us an overview of what we've learned from this book. So James chapter 2, uh, verse 17 and 18, we're going to be looking at this morning, just those two verses. 17 starts off with these words. It says, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Now, this verse, let me remind you, is not talking about salvation. It's not saying that you can earn your salvation or that you need to add works to your salvation. Scriptures are very clear. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is a good example of this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a grace of God that saves you. You come to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So God has given us this gift, and you respond by believing in faith. And then it emphasizes there in the next verse, it's not by works so that nobody can boast. So when James writes this in verse 17, he says, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Is not talking about salvation. He is writing to Christians. He's writing to people who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, that understand that it is a gift of God. They understand it's by grace. They understand it's through faith that they're saved. But what he's talking to is these Christians, and he's saying, is your life reflecting that salvation. Or uh, another way of saying that is the nature of faith is to produce deeds. So this faith that you put in Jesus Christ should naturally be producing in you these godly deeds. And he's, throughout the book of James, he's talking about what do these godly deeds look like? What are these things that the Holy Spirit is wanting to produce in you? Now, I want to go back and kind of define that term deeds. What do we mean, what is he meaning when he talks about these deeds that should be in your life? So first of all, I want you to understand that deeds do not mean doing good things, all right? We, we often want to associate that with doing good things. There are plenty of people who are not saved, have no interest in the gospel, no interest in Jesus Christ, and do lots of really good things. So we're not talking here just about being good. You can not be saved and you can be well behaved. Uh, we, we, we do this bad thing too with that. We, we want to associate often these, these deeds that we're doing as being good things and that can lead us into a lot of trouble. I remember as a youth minister, I'd have parents come to me and they were deeply concerned that their kids get saved. But they really weren't concerned that their kids have a relationship with God. What they really wanted was their kids to clean their room and not talk back. And they associated that if their kids got saved, they would do good things. And here's what would happen. We would we'd spend time sharing the gospel, and the Holy Spirit would move. Often you know, going to camp would be one of the places that we'd go to camp, and they could share the gospel. And they would accept Jesus Christ, and they would have a relationship with God. And guess what? They still didn't clean the room, and they would still talk back. And parents 
would question their salvation. I don't think my kid's really saved. I don't think they really made a decision because their room's still a mess. They associated doing good with evidence of salvation. The, the worst was when you'd have a, a, a youth and you knew they'd never made a decision for Jesus Christ and you'd go to the parents and they'd say, oh, no, 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 they're a good kid. They do whatever I say. They must be saved. And by the way, you, we do the same thing sometimes with our, our spouses aren't saved. We, do we really want our spouse to have a relationship with God or we just want our spouse to be behaved? Or our neighbor, to, to, do we want them to have a relationship with God or we really want them to be behaved? Deeds are not good things. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing good things. And if you're a youth this morning, do not, do not go home and say, the pastor said I don't have to make my, clean up my room anymore. That is not what the pastor said. All right? I'm just saying that you can be a Christian and still have a messy bedroom. Amen? All right. Thank you. There's one person with me here. All right. So we don't, let's not associate it with good deeds. So what are, are the good things? So we don't associate the deeds with good things. What, what are they? Well, one of the ways to understand the deeds is sharing the gospel and giving glory to God. So the, the deeds here that are going on, these deeds that the Holy Spirit wants to produce in you, are going to reflect the gospel message, not, not just simply that, that simple accepting Jesus Christ, but the overall gospel message of what God is doing, the fallenness, the, the goodness that he's created, the fallenness of humanity, the redemption that's come through Christ, the restoration that we look forward to. That, that whole thing, those deeds are going to give testimony to that, and the deeds are going to give glory to God. So one of the scariest passages, I think, in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 7. I'm just going to share a little part of it. It says, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That should already scare us. So he's saying, not everybody who says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22 goes on and says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles? Now, can we all agree that those are good things? Those are good things. Prophesying in the Lord's, that's a teaching of the Scripture. That's a good thing. Uh, casting out demons, always a good thing to get rid of demons. Uh, performing miracles, those are all good things. And they're doing it in Jesus' name. Right? But look at Jesus' response. And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoer. We say, wait a minute. If something should qualify a person as being saved, I would think it would be prophesying and casting out demons and performing miracles. Clearly that person has to be saved. But Jesus is not impressed. Why? Because the last part he says, only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. How do you distinguish between good things and godly deeds? Because godly deeds are things done under the command of God. They are the work of the Holy Spirit leading you to do it. Good things you get to determine. Good things you get to make your list of the good things you're going to do, and you can say, look, here's the good things I'm doing, and they show I'm a Christian. But godly deeds are the work of God. They are the will of the Father in you, producing these things. So that's why it's important as we look at this and we talk about those deeds that we understand as he says, only the one who does the will of the Father. That emphasis. So the deeds are on giving glory to God. They're on doing the things that the Holy Spirit is producing in you. And that, that brings me to my third point. Deeds are a result of the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. So every Christian, when you when you accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to abide in you, that third person of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit's desire is to produce in you deeds. You don't have to beg the Holy Spirit to produce in you godly deeds. You don't have to try to manipulate the Spirit to produce godly deeds in you. The Holy Spirit wants to produce these deeds in you. The problem for us is not that the, the Holy Spirit's not producing the deeds. The problem is that we're fighting against what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit naturally wants to produce these deeds that are going to give glory to God. They're going to testify to the gospel. They are going to be in obedience to God. Why? The third person of the Trinity, you know that that's out of obedience to the Father that the Holy Spirit is producing it, and yet we fight against it. That's why Paul, 
the church in Thessalonians, or First Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica says to him this simple statement, 519, don't quench the Spirit. Because that's what we do. We fight against what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. We're, we're, we're going against what he's trying to create these deeds. And so that going back to James, he says, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. What he's saying is not that you're not saved, but there's something, well, we see here, maybe possibly you aren't if it's not being produced. There could be a warning sign in there that it's, you go, well, the Holy Spirit's not producing anything. Maybe there's no Holy Spirit. So we'll get that in a minute. But if you are saved, then why are you fighting against the Holy Spirit producing these deeds in you? What, what is keeping you from that? So as I said, one reason may be there's just no faith there. Maybe as I talked about that, that youth being good, you were like, that was me. I, I wanted to be good. And so I, I made this statement. I said this prayer. I got dunked in the water so that I could be a good kid, to be a good person. And I'm striving to be a good person. But you never really made a decision to accept Jesus Christ. You never came to that point in your life in which you said, you know, I'm a, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and that Jesus, I believe that he's fully God, fully human, that he came and he died on the cross for my sins, that he rose again, that he's coming back. I've, I've never made that decision. I made a confession. I've been striving to be a good guy, but what you're telling me is I need to have the Holy Spirit in me. If there's an absence of these godly deeds, let this be a warning flag. I'm not saying to you, if you're not saved, I'm not saying to you that you're not a good person. But I am saying to you those good deeds are not going to save you. And if you're in a place in which you're trying to survive on those good deeds, that's not going to bring you salvation. It's, as a matter of fact, that brings us kind of to our, our second thing you sometimes run into it, is that we mistake those good things for godly deeds. And so we're we, we, as a Christian and the Holy Spirit's in us, but we don't want to see what the Holy Spirit's doing. And so we start associating, look at all the good stuff I do, and I'm not against you doing good stuff, but you're associating it with godly deeds. Now, how do I know I'm falling into that, Chris? Here's one of the ways that you can know you're doing that. If you find that you're evaluating yourself, or even more, if you find yourself that you're evaluating other Christians based on them not doing the good stuff that you do, then you're caught up in doing good things, not godly deeds. When you're pursuing godly deeds, you're concerned about what the Holy Spirit's producing in you, and you're concerned about how to help other people in the Holy Spirit as they're producing those things. But when you're caught up in good things, it's all about evaluating. I'm a good Christian because I do these good things. They're a bad Christian because they don't do these good things. But when it's about godly deeds and you're looking at saying, look what the Holy Spirit is doing, look what is the Holy Spirit trying to do, what is he producing in me, these godly deeds, and then you look at someone else and say, how can I help you? and not quenching that spirit and being at work. So that's, that's a good way of kind of judging those. Are, are, you, are, you, are you focused on the glory of God, or are you focused on judging other people and how they're doing? And here's the thing about good things. Good things are great until something bad happens in your life. And if you're all about doing good things instead of the spirit producing godly deeds, when something bad happens in your life, the good things don't really give you any foundation to hold on to. As a matter of fact, you'll say this. You'll say, you know what? I've done all those good things, and God did something bad to me. How could God, after all the good things I do, treat me like this? See, good things won't carry you through the trials and the storms. But godly deeds, godly deeds carry you through it. Because as you go into that trial, into that storm, you go, hey, what is the Holy Spirit wanting to produce in me during this time? We've gone through this, this year, oh, man, a year, this pandemic, and we're not done. We're getting close. We're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, which is exciting, but we're not done yet. But, but what has this year produced in us? Have we, have we looked at it, and we've looked at these things of the past year, and we've said, well, look at the good stuff I've done. Look at the bad stuff other people have done. I've been with the program. They haven't been with the program. Or have we looked at it over the past year and we said, what has the Holy Spirit been producing in me? What has the Holy Spirit been at work at? How, how have I given glory to God through this? How have I given testimony to the gospel in this? 
So there, there's a difference between those two things, good things and godly deeds. And then there's, here's the third thing. The reason why deeds aren't present is you're just resisting the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's at work. The Holy Spirit's doing His thing. The Holy Spirit's going to do the things, but we, we don't really want the Holy Spirit to be at work in us. And you might say, Chris, that is absolutely ridiculous. Why would any Christian not want the Holy Spirit to be at work in them? Well, one reason is pride. I mean, to let the Holy Spirit be at work in you, you have to surrender. You have to say, all right, Holy Spirit, you're in charge, and I'm not. And, you know, we, we sing the song, all to Jesus I surrender, but we don't really surrender anything to Jesus. We want Jesus to surrender to us and do what we want. So we resist it because our pride doesn't allow us to be at work. You know, another thing that can get you in trouble is falling into false teachings. We've gone through this pandemic, and one of the incredible things that we've been able to do is to broadcast our message out there on the Internet. And so we're, every week, uh, Mike Higdon and others come together, and they, they broadcast this message out there. And that's been terrific that you can tune in and watch the service. But you know what people found out? There's a whole lot of sermons out there on the Internet. And not all of them are truthful. Not all of them are sharing the gospel. A lot of them are counter to the gospel. They're doing false teachings. And they're just, they're out there and they can make the video and they can show it and it can sound good and it can sound wonderful and you can embrace it because it's saying what you want it to say and you like it. But there's no one behind it checking it out to make sure it's okay. And you'll start buying into those false teachings. If you start buying into those false teachings, that interferes in what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. So not only is it, oh, I'm just maybe believing something not necessarily true. It's not a big deal. I'm just kind of holding this maybe true. Maybe. No, that hinders your life spiritually. See, I'm okay. Some people are watching me on the Internet this morning. But I have a group of individuals behind me that check what I say and what I preach. And if I preach something that is not true, they're going to pull me aside and they're going to say, what you taught is not scripturally accurate. You need to stay accurate with the scriptures. So I, every sermon that I present to you has already first gone through individuals checking it to make sure that it is theologically and biblically correct. Then afterwards, I have people that check me. There is a back, uh, you know, I mess. I can't just get up here and say whatever I want. But there's false teachings that are out there. And during the pandemic, they have just exploded and they look nice but are you checking it are you seeing what's behind it who's backing these individuals who are doing these teachings and these false teachings i said will cause you to resist the work of the spirit because they're going contrary to the holy spirit and then some some of us we just we resist the holy spirit because well, we're just not ready to change we're not ready to make the change that, that, that the Holy Spirit wants to do. We, some of you this morning are right there. You know it. The Holy Spirit is telling you what you need to do. It, you're, there's no question. You're not questioning it. You're not un, you know, unsure of it. You know exactly what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And you're like, I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to give that. Because it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. And I'm not qualified. And I may fail. And God's like, yeah, that's exactly why I'm picking you. Because that's what keeps you humble and trusting me. But we, we, we don't want to do it because it's just kind of a fear. I don't know which of the three gets in there, but all three of those play a part in us resisting what the Holy Spirit wants to do. But the Holy Spirit is wanting to produce in us these wonderful deeds, these godly deeds. That's why in verse 18, uh, James, going back there in 17, where it says it's dead, he says, some of you will say, you have faith and I have deeds. And really he's reversing the statement because a bunch of people are going around saying, well, I have deeds, but I don't have faith. And he says, show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. What he's saying is a living faith is producing these godly deeds, not just good things, but producing these godly things that we should be seeing that should be sharing the gospel message 
and should be giving glory to God. And so the book of James, that's what it's about. And if we go through this whole series starting in October and we get all the way here and all you got out of the book of James was a list of things you're supposed to do, then you miss the point. It's not a book with a list of things you're supposed to do. It's a book talking about the things that the Holy Spirit is doing in you and ask you, are you fighting against this? And that would be the great tragedy of the whole sermon series is all you walk away with is a list of good things to do instead of seeing the greatness of what God is trying to do through the Holy Spirit. So, so listen, listen to a few of these. We talked about perseverance. But we talked not just simply about persevering. We said we persevere under trials because we look forward to the crown of life that awaits us. So it's just not be good, persevere. It's the Holy Spirit's producing in you perseverance so that you point people towards the life that is to come and to speak about heaven. We, we saw how the Scriptures talked about asking God for wisdom. Well, it's not just it's good that you're asking God for wisdom, but it's the Holy Spirit is moving you to see that He is the source of all true wisdom. James talks about being humble. But it's not that, okay, I'm a good person because I'm a, a humble person but that the Holy Spirit is producing in us this humility so that we might be compassionate to others. Good thing is, look how humble I am. The godly deed is producing humility so that I show compassion to other people. We are to avoid anger. If we just took it as good, don't be angry, that's bad. But if we see it as the Holy Spirit at work in me, we see instead that he's working in me not to be angry so that I might pursue God's righteousness and to his glory. We saw how the Spirit is to control our tongue. Now, good says, so there's words you can say and words you can't say. Godly deeds is, the Spirit is at work in my tongue so that my faith that I share will not seem worthless. That every word I say of importance and speaks to the truthfulness of God. You see the difference between the two? If we just make it a list about good things to do, then it becomes, this is a list of things I should do. And then it becomes a list of things I should have done. And then it becomes a list of things I never did. But instead, if we see this is stuff that the Holy Spirit's supposed to be developing in me, then we start looking and we say, Holy Spirit, what are you developing in me? What are you working in me? What are you doing? Perseverance. That's what the Holy Spirit's working on for me is perseverance. Great. What's the Holy Spirit working on for you, and how can I encourage you in that? Not judge you, but how can, because the Holy Spirit may be working a little bit different. What, what, what is it that, uh, don't exploit people. I'm dealing with exploitation. Okay, Holy Spirit, what are you producing? Don't do that because it misspeaks about the, the gift of God and grace. Okay, Holy Spirit, work in me and change that as opposed to making a list of good and bad. So we need to commit ourselves to allowing the Spirit to develop these deeds for the glory of God. That's why Christianity is not about being good. It's about being obedient. That's why they can come to him and say, we prophesied and we cast out demons and we performed miracles. And he says, I never knew you. Because they were out there doing it because they wanted to do it. We're over here, the folks who are doing it because God called me to prophesy or God called me to cast out demons or God called me to perform miracles or God called me to teach or God called me to wash my tongue or God called me to be a Christian business person. Or It's out of obedience. I went to this uh, art exhibit one time. It was one of those modern sort of art exhibits that are kind of interesting. As a, you know, I understand paintings. I don't always understand the modern art. And it was this, this column that was there. And on the front side of the column was a computer screen, and it had one of those old computer chess games. You guys may remember from the 80s and 90s on there. And so the, you saw on the front of it was the computer game, and you would, you would see the computer pieces moving as the computer played itself in chess. But if you walked around the column and you went to the other side, there was this bigger screen. And that screen showed you what the computer was thinking 
before every move. And so you would see a pawn move, and then the computer, and it would run lines, would show you every possible move it can make, then every possible move that could be made in response to that, then every possible move it could make after that, and then every possible move it could be made after that. It played the entire game. And I, and I read on the card that they had slowed it down so that I could watch it as a computer ran through every possibility that could occur in making its move. And every move it made, it played out the entire game to see what was going to happen. Now, in the front of that column, all I saw was a chess game. And I saw a pawn move here or a knight move here or a bishop move there. But behind it, the whole time the computer was playing out the entire game. My brothers and sisters, all you see in your life is this chessboard. And you can have the Holy Spirit telling you to move here or move there. Or the Holy Spirit saying to move this piece or move that piece. And you can wonder, what, what does that mean? Why am I moving the knight there? Why am I putting the bishop? I don't, I don't understand. I don't see it. But behind that, what you do not see is that the Holy Spirit has played out the entire game. He is the third person of the Trinity, the all-knowing, all-controlling God. And while you don't see it all, he does. And the question is not whether you understand how the game is going to be played out. The question is, are you willing to be obedient to what the Spirit says and move to the square you're to move? The book of James puts that challenge before us. Will you allow the Spirit to produce you in these deeds? Am I good enough to get? No, the Holy Spirit's going to do it. Will you allow Him to do it? Will you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, this morning, as we conclude this sermon, so much we want to see the game all played out. We want to see how everything is going to happen. We want to have a sense that we understand it all. A year ago, we thought we knew what was happening. But we had no clue. But you weren't surprised by any of it. So, Lord, help us as believers. Cause us to be committed to trusting you and to being obedient. To allow your spirit to produce in us those godly deeds. And, Lord, I pray for those this morning who maybe by good are trying to be saved, are assuring themselves that they're saved by good things they've done, that this morning your Spirit will move on them. And they will realize salvation comes by faith in you. And may the rest of us who have made that decision continue to live out a living, breathing faith. In your precious name we pray. Amen. We're going to go to a time of invitation. And as Jason plays, we encourage you to spend some time with the Lord and talking to him about this sermon. Let's, let's not just come in here and then just walk back out. But let's examine ourselves. And if you have questions or challenges or you have prayers that you need, there's a perforate sheet you can fill out. Or there's emails or phone numbers. Make use of those. We'd love to spend some time with you. Amen. Would you please stand as we respond together?
to Jason Shaw for his election as associate pastor. Jason, what are you doing over there? Okay, number two, we have a couple celebrations going on today. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we have a virtual wedding shower for Rebecca Taylor Kloss. Um, I think Alyssa is setting that up, I believe. Um, April 11th, we have a virtual welcome baby reception for the Pompu baby, um, Daniel. Uh, let's see, March 28th, um, Gary says we are cutting edge. Um, on Palm Sunday, we are doing the, the what's Christmas Easter caroling again for those shut-ins. I think Jason is organizing that, so please see Jason if you would like to go around and do Easter caroling. That is uh, March 28th at 2 o'clock. And then also, parents of youth. Where are my parents of youth? How would you all like to have a week of clean rooms, clean beds, um, maybe you're wanting a little romantic weekend getaway, need to spark that marriage again, I have the perfect deal for you. June 10th through the 14th is youth camp. Sit, uh, sign up your kid, get them out of the house for a week. You have the whole house to yourself. You can take a little weekend trip. Um, please see me. The deadline is March, 20, March 21st. Um, $75 deposit, 
and um, we're going to take care of the kids for a week, so you'll be free of all that back talking and bed not making that Chris was talking about earlier. So, um, yeah, see me March 21st is the deadline, and we'll take them off to camp. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much um, for this for this place, for this family, for this body that you have called us into, Lord. And Father God, as we have those in the church who are celebrating marriages and, and new babies, Lord, we celebrate with them, Lord, and the ones in our, in our family who are um, fighting sickness and, and different things, Father God, we mourn with them. And we thank you that as a body, we are all here together um, to grow and encourage one another. And Father God, I am so thankful to be in a church body that encourages us to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and serve in the ways that is your will. And as we leave this place, Father God, I pray that you would help us to live out our life according to your will, to shine that light to others, Lord. Help us to be mindful of the needs of others, Lord, so that we can help encourage them as we go. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.